morning and welcome to Beer Coma Presents. I'm your host, Will Matthews. We are in downtown St. Paul at one of the city's newest breweries, Tin Whiskers, which just opened up earlier this year. We're going to meet with Jeff, who's one of the co-owners of the brewery, and we're going to talk to him about what makes the beer so great. So grab a beer, kick back, and join with us. Prost! Okay, I'm here with Jeff. Jeff, thanks for hosting us today. Hey, thanks for having us. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Tin Whiskers. When did you guys get started? Uh, we started this company back in 2011, and uh, it's kind of when we formed uh, the idea of it. But really our story starts back in 2006. Uh, at that time, I had just graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree of electrical engineering, and uh, I met up with Jake Johnson, one of my founding partners, mm -hmm. and we uh, ended up working in the same company and decided, you know, we were getting the craft beer scene and exploring all these new beers. So we decided, well, let's start this home brewing thing. It seemed really interesting. There's a lot of science and process and art behind it. It seemed really kind of attractive. So we went down our first kit together and uh, first put the kit in, a uh, reading kit from Northern Brewer, and we went up to his mom and dad's house in, in Roseville there, and uh, we brewed our first batch of beer and, and instantly just fell in love with everything. You know, the science, just reading about it, the detail, just the recipe creation. So, process. can I just interrupt you here real quick on this one? So, so as you started out as a home brewer, what was the craziest thing you home brewed? The craziest thing we tried to home brew happened when we were actually trying to start this company. And we were switching all grain brewing and uh, we're trying all kinds of crazy different recipes. Um, and we tried one called a carrot here. At the okay. time I was eating a uh, ridiculous amount of carrots and you know, my business partner thought it would be funny to I get carrot beer and call me the carrot side. So we made this carrot beer. It was the most ill fated thing I think we ever did. And uh, we put in like three times as much molasses because, you know, when you're home brewing then, you know, you've been drinking quite a bit. Yeah. And so that, that led to that kind of ill fated beer. We never did recreate it. It tasted awesome. We ended up dumping it. Any chances we could see something like that in the future? Uh, I don't I think we're never going to try carrot beer again. <laughs> but uh, we definitely are always trying to look to, to push uh, ingredients, bring new ingredients in the brewing process. Okay. We make that pretty well known with you know, our, our pumpkin pie beer, the shocking pumpkin, or the Wheatstone Bridge, honey candy and weed. So uh, we try to really dabble a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but go ahead and I'll let you continue on with your story. Yeah. So um, we got our first year brewing in uh, Jake's parents' house for a period of summer, and his mother was nice enough to let us do that. Um, even though she hated the beer, she hated the smell, she hated the mess. <laughs> I mean, she didn't like anything about it, so I don't know why she put up with us that long. But. By the end of the summer, we kind of each went our own way and just kept home brewing, kept sharing our beers with each other and mm -hmm. stuff. And by this point, four years later, I was getting really tired of engineering and, uh, and was still loving the brewing process. And we had toured Surly and Flat Earth and listened to Jeff Omar's founding stories and I'm really inspired that he even be a 10 year veteran of the industry and start a brewery. You know, it's something that is approachable if you have the capital. And so, um, you know, we are naively believe that we could do it. So we set off to do that. And it took four years. We wrote 200 page business plan, we ended up raising over $600,000 of private equity. equity. And did you guys crowdsource at all? We did not. Okay. We did the old fashioned private equity uh, fundraising. And it was uh, it was pretty brutal. It took a year and a half to get the money. I bet. Um, we had, at that, during that time as well, we searched, pretty much scoured every spot in Roseville and uh, St. Paul for a location. Um, and eventually, after looking at 50 different sites, they on this one. Why St. Paul? So uh, when we started the brewery after a period of summer, uh, we moved the brewery from Jake's house in his garage to my basement because I was a bachelor, I lived alone, had this massive basement. What better to do with it? So yeah. we turned into a, our pilot brewery. We pretty much operated an brewery. We had a half barrel system. We had a one barrel uh, chemical fermenter and temp control. You name it, we had it. We still take this amount of money on the home brew setup. And what we did during this time in Louisville is we iterated all of our beers uh, about six to eight different times. And to kind of really get the good recipes we wanted, um, required good feedback. And at the time, we were working together at the same company in downtown Minneapolis called Start and Design Solutions. Mm -hmm. So every Friday, I would bring beer in the morning from the parking ramp, block to the office, and about the coworkers. And of course, it starts with getting a lot of Minnesota nice feedback. You know, you're not getting a lot of anything critical. Yeah, it's a lot of people shaking their head. Yes, yeah, or you know, this will sugar coated, you know, and so. In order for us to really become you know, great, great recipes, we decided to institute a beer school. So for about a period of summer, in the Wednesdays, we reserved a conference room in our office at like 5 p.m. And what we did is we brought in beers, we taught uh, everyone about styles, we taught them about how to fill up the BJCP judging form, we taught them, we did a Siebel off-flavor kit, which is super interesting. I recommend, you know, 
couple people come together and get a kit. It's just, it's really worth doing. And really, out of that, we pretty much train them to be your testers and be confident in filling out the judging sheets and stuff and also own a recipe. So, the long story short is uh, in Roseville, we buy our water wholesale from St. Paul. Okay. And so, uh, we believe strongly in the fair water for water. The locality of it is a huge component to its flavor and its beer. And we spend all this time iterating on these recipes. St. Paul water and how to change that. Um, other criteria that we're in the picking in St. Paul is it's kind of laid back old school feel. Strong brewing tradition. It's very much a neighborhood focused kind of, kind of city, um, and just it's just unrepresented. I mean, up until you know, the last five months, it's just flatter than the sun over here. Yep. So, so okay. Paul is new. Yes, definitely. And now I actually see quite a few of them uh, springing up here in St. Paul. So, were you guys number three officially, uh, or of the new batch, we're the fourth one? You're the fourth one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's Bang, Bernie Brothers, Urban Growler. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, well, you guys have one of the most impressive social media campaigns I've ever seen from a, from a brewery as of late. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, let's let's talk about a little bit about this guy that's standing back here behind me because he's kind of a key component to your guys' uh, social media campaign. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that the robot's name is Tim Whiskers. Yeah. No, the robot's name is just the robot this time. Okay. The robot has one name, it's just and a robot. It's, it's unnamed. At some point, maybe in the, near, in the future, we'll hold some contests to name said robot. Um, but until that time, he's just, he's just called robot. So. Okay, so why, wh where did the robot, how did that come into play as, as part of the team? So it's kind of a, a little lengthy story. So the company, Tim Whiskers, is founded by three electrical engineers. Um, and at the time, we all three worked at the same company, we did the same work on the same project, and stuff like that. And so when we set up to bring the company, we wanted a strong, theme or brand to tie together other than our affinity for craft beer. That's the strongest link between the three of us was uh, professional and uh, company background. So we wanted a name for that. So what we did is we um, did many happy hours with all our coworkers, literally just went through the law streets and just threw up names and saw what pens and sticking and stuff. Ultimately we settled on three names. We had Ted Whiskers, we had Holmes Brewing and Logic Ale. Okay. And we worked with the graphic designer and branded them all up. Separately, and then we presented them to friends, family, coworkers, strangers, and tested out what would work, what really got people excited. And Tim Whiskers was, was by far the big winner. So, what was Tim Whiskers' stand for? So, Tim Whiskers is actually a prominent place in the electronics industry. We use tin as a, one of our materials for solder, and pure tin has this property where it grows fine temperatures on the surface. Okay. And scientists don't understand why this happens. It has something to do with the atom structure and how the atom moves around the process. Well, this problem causes short circuits on our circuit boards. These cause you know, pretty much failures in the field. So um, ultimately, that's what the name is what it's about. But um, it's a cool sounding name and time to like one of and stuff. And, and you know, kind of to, to bring the engineering background and brand team forward in an approachable manner that's accessible to everyone. Uh, we decided to go with a robot. And okay. we kind of modeled it after why not a drinking robot. What better <laughs> thing? We're a brewing company of engineers, you know. So it kind of really tied in together, gave a nice approachable image, um, and a really fun character for us to, to show off. So, <laughs> cool, cool, yeah, I love the logo. It's, it's, it's very unique and very, very stylish, and very modern. Yeah. It's something that you don't see a whole lot of from a lot of the other people that are out there. Okay, so now standing behind me, uh, we're standing right behind uh, the Ten Whiskers, uh, the actual brewery itself here. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, about uh, your, your brewery itself. So what kind of equipment you got standing back here? Yeah, so we have uh, we bought all of our equipment brand new for Minnetonka Brewing Equipment out of Minnetonka, Minnesota here. Um, we really like the equipment we saw at Lucid 612, um, Big Wood, and just kept seeing the quality of it and keep improving. So what we have back here is a 15 barrel brew house, two vessel. Uh, we have five 15 barrel fermenters and 15 barrel bright. And based on our fermentation times and stuff, we can produce about 1,500 barrels of beer with the equipment we have back here. Okay. Um, what do you have brewing back there now? Today we brewed our Wheatstone Bridge. It's our most unique offering at the moment. It's a honey cameo wheat beer. Uh, definitely one of our most popular beers. The honey and the cameo really blend well to give a nice pineapple note. So. Okay. Otherwise, in the tanks, we have pretty much every tank full. Um, we've been at that capacity you now for a couple months, so we have some IPAs, other pumpkin brewing, we got a, an amber 
So, man, we're doing good. But uh, on the average, how long does it take you to brew a batch from, from start to, to brew, uh, production? Uh, the act of brewing takes roughly 10 to 12 hours, depending on how long it takes to clean. Uh, our then production time, the fermentation time, takes anywhere for about pretty much two to three weeks for any of our ales, five weeks for our Ampere Amber, which is an Amber California Common, eight weeks for a Pilsner. And uh, our times take probably a lot longer than a lot of other breweries. We spend, um, we don't use any filtering. We didn't believe in it. We'd rather keep our beer natural and keep the flavors we intended to have in there, including yeast, uh, moving forward. So we let the beer naturally mature to let the yeast naturally flock out. So it takes a bit longer. But then it was a, I think a much better quality product. Beer, beer, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, totally. Now, these three things back here, I, I don't normally see these in most breweries. Is this, uh, what, what, what is this standing back behind here? So this is a uh, carryover from the pile system in the basement we, okay. we touched on. And so what we did is we upgraded the tanks to be a one barrel uh, output size, and it's all tri clamp fitted and stuff like that. So this is our pile plant that we use in the basement. And we're continuing to use that here at Tin Whiskers to pilot other beers, do some green exercises like single hop series of beers. Mm -hmm. um, and we're even intending to uh, someday in the near future open it up to home brewers within the neighborhood here. Okay. And really help drive home that this is a neighborhood brewery and really kind of drive some new growth and, and life into uh, restaurant creation. Really support the home brewer uh, community out there. Well, totally. We really need that here in Minnesota. There's not a whole lot of places that do that yet. Yeah, you know, that's where we came from and we're all about supporting them. So, um, are you, now if there's one thing, if you had to start all over again, if there's one thing that you had to keep about this brewery, what would you keep? The one thing I would keep? Mm-hmm. What was the one thing that you would bring on with you the next, uh, to the next brewery? Oh, if I were to move? Yeah. Uh, well, for one, we'll never move. This is going to always be our public face. It always intended to be the, the ideal tavern spot. Mm -hmm. You know, as our tend to grow and stuff, we kind of were looking at, uh, doing some contract brewing and then moving forward and do a second brewing plant that's somewhere within the city of St. Paul or, or Roseville. Is there one thing out there that you would improve about this brewery, uh, brewery if you had the chance? Um, uh, money not being an object? You know, it, if I had no money or money wasn't the object or you change anything, I would just make this space bigger but keep its coolness in the same neighborhood because it's a very unique space in of itself. 17 foot ceilings, uh, three walls of massive windows. Uh, it's just very light and airy here, and that's what I, I love about it, and it makes our perfect public space. Now, if somebody wanted to come in and do a brewery tour with you, when do you guys offer your tours? Typically, do them Saturdays, usually by appointment. Um, some Saturdays, I'll just do a standing 2 p.m. kind of tour, but feel free to email us. We're always more than willing to schedule um, a tour with you. Okay. And then, uh, how about taproom hours? So, taproom wise, we're open Wednesday through Sunday. Um, Wednesday and Thursday, we're open from 4 to 10. Thursday, 3. Wednesday and Thursday, 4 to 10. Friday, 3 to 11. Saturday, noon to 11. And Sunday will be open noon to 5. There you go. So for you guys looking to uh, come out here and uh, check out their fine beers, those are the times. circuit boards at one time? So, uh, when we set out to kind of really carry the brand full circle and attack from being the major component of your brand identity, what we did is instead of going with the wood like everyone else does, uh, I threw out the idea, why don't we make circuit boards and really kind of drive home the whole engineering theme. Mm -hmm. So I, what I did is I spent about five or six hours custom designing the circuit board here. It's all custom, that's non-working, I've taken uh, layouts from different kind of projects I've done in the past. And and or go to it and stuff, and I worked with uh, one of my PCB vendors and got a couple prices on it. So we, we custom fabricated everything about it. Um, my uncle, you know, the ranch manufacturing, helped cut out the plexiglass here, and then me and my family uh, glued them all together and put feet on and stuff. So. They're excellent. That's so creative. Uh, I mean, I love it. It's just part of that whole, the, the Tim Whiskers experience. Um, but let's talk about your beers here. This is what everybody kind of wants to know about. So tell me about this first one right here. So the first one here is our Wheatstone Bridge. It's a honey cameo wheat beer. It's our most unique offering. 
Uh, it, both beer drinkers and non-beer drinkers alike love it. It's uh, very heavily on the chamomile tea, and the way this beer kind of kind of flows together, you get a nice pineapple note out, out of it. You also can taste a lot of the clover honey that's used. So. Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I definitely taste it. And as a chamomile drinker, as a tea drinker, I mean, I'm noticing the chamomile flavors that come out of it too. Oh, yeah. So what was the inspiration behind this beer? Um, How did you decide tea needed the belong the beer? Yeah, so, you know, we were experimenting a lot of different beers, looking at some crazy recipe books and stuff, and then, you know, it's all you throw tea in beer. So we tried out a bunch of different tea beers, and um, I've been drinking a lot of tea at that point, still do, and I came across a recipe that kind of mentioned using camel, you know, so kind of further enhanced that recipe, adding honey, and different kind of built it into what it is now. It's just so much camel in it that it's just, it melts so well. Okay, and you said this one, uh, earlier you said this one was available all year round? Yep, it's a year round. Okay. Definitely a great summer beer. It's got mm -hmm. a great color, great flavor, um, and it's it's light yet it's fulfilling. Yeah. So, and that's I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about it. So, um, it's a delicious beer all around. So, uh, what's next? Our next one here is our fall seasonal. It's our Shaki Pumpkin. It's okay. a pumpkin pie beer. We use 100, 300 pounds of real pumpkin in the mash, and we douse it pretty decently with some pumpkin pie spices. And like many of our beers, you'll find it to be very well balanced, very well um, complex, yet balanced. Your, your palate will get tired of it, it's not really sweet. So, kind of our theme, our, our, our philosophy of doing our recipes. Mm -hmm. And that one's definitely a shiny example of that. It's that's, that's an extremely good example of that. There aren't a whole lot of pumpkin beers in Minnesota, so. Um, how, how did you guys decide to go about to say, hey, let's, let's take a rest of the blue pumpkin beer? I mean, did you see the need for it, or...? We, we did, and we really loved, at the time, drinking on pumpkin beer. And, you know, Mummy Train from Flat Earth being one of them that kind of really inspired us to, to try to make our own, and when we finally did, we really liked it, so we kind of bring it a little bit. Sounds good. What's the EBD on that one? That one comes in about 5.5%. 5.5? Okay. Our next one here is our Flip Switch IPA. Uh, we kind of describe this as a Midwest style IPA. It's very, very balanced. So we get a nice malt character out of it. We use Maris Otter as the base malt. And then what you'll get in the, in the finish here is really citrus grapefruit flavors and aromas. This beer still carries 64 IBUs in it. Uh, so it still packs a punch, but it's balanced enough that you can actually have a meal with it. It really complements a lot of things nicely. Well, not only that, but after, after my first taste of this, I mean, I actually feel like I want another one. Where a lot of IPs, I feel, get way too over hop and out of balance. Where I'm getting the hoppiness from it. I mean, the hop lovers will love this, but the people who want craft beer are going to want this too. So, and that's, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, yes. so I mean, I'm, I'm really digging this one, and I, and I don't say that often very about IPAs. So, um, I, I really am enjoying this one. It's got a great color to it, and I love the Brussels lace on it. I mean, it's I mean, you can just see the crap and the quality in this one, just even just by picking up the glass. Thank you. So our, our last one that we're uh, tasting here today is our uh, short circuit stout on nitro. It's a sweet stout. You'll get uh, we use about seven different grains in it. You'll get a nice notes of roast, uh, chocolate. But it's not going to be too uh, stringent or uh, roasty. It's really well balanced. You get a nice sweet finish to it. Mm -hmm. We originally designed this one to really go with uh, make a beer flow. And it goes phenomenally with a really nice. Oh, I bet that it does sound good just even just, just saying it. So it's, yeah. Um, I had a question about this one, but I can't remember what it was. So, um, and what's the EDD on this one? And that comes in five point three. Okay. What's your strongest beer that you have? Our strongest is our IP. It comes in at six point two. Six point two, and that was this one, right? Yep, the flip switch IP. We try to keep most of our beers in the five to six range. It's, you can drink more than one of them, you're not going to be too intoxicated. Enjoy yourself. Okay, uh, struggling with from Reddit, um, asked a question. Uh, so far, we've seen that you guys are able to do a lot of standard styles of beers, at least standard for the Minnesota capital. Do you have plans for other styles in the near future, such as Saisons, Black IPAs, Rye, and Belgians? Good question. We've been spending so much time just getting this brewery up and running and, and getting our recipes we have perfected over the last four years up and, up and going that we haven't really put too much into that yet. But a, a really good rye beer, I think, would be something we're really going to be looking at doing. Um, I think a Belgian is definitely on the list. Um, probably definitely a Saison. Um, 
mostly targeting kind of some Scottish ales, stuff like that. Okay. So that's kind of the future of what we're going here. Uh, last question that we have, uh, just kind of a general question we'd like to ask, is uh, where if uh, somebody wanted to get your, your beer outside of the tap room, where is it available? We're currently in, I think up to today, 35 different bars and restaurants throughout the Twin Cities metro. Okay. Uh, we sell our kegs, half their own six burial from Zip's Liquor Store. Um, and to find out what, what bars and restaurants we're at, uh, if you go to our website, um, find us or where to find us, you'll see a, a map there that has all of our locations. Um, and then pretty soon here in the fall, um, we're getting on label approval, but we'll be doing a 22 ounce bottle bond um, okay. uh, for about six to ten liquor stores. So. Look forward to seeing them in the liquor stores. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, guys, uh, that's it from Tin Whiskers. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for hosting us. And uh, thank you guys for uh, tuning in, and uh, we'll see you at the next podcast. Prost. Salon